Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another virtual Schulich Connects. For those that I haven't had the opportunity to meet before, my name is Bill Rosart, and I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Schulich School of Engineering here at the University of Calgary. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of Calgary is on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. And the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. A few housekeeping items before we begin. We will be doing audience Q&A at the end. What makes these panels and our Schulich Connect so special is the interaction that we have with you, the audience. So please post your questions uh, using the Zoom webinar Q&A function. And for most of you, that will be located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to post questions throughout the panel. We're going to start with a few questions that I'm going to ask the panel members. But as your questions come in, I will actually start to insert them in. So let's make this as engaged as possible. We have a lot of people joining us today. So I'm going to take a few minutes here at the beginning and share a little bit about the Schulich School of Engineering. So this year we let in, we admitted over 900 first year students. So this is a new record. So even during the pandemic, we saw the demand for our programs continue to rise. We have at this point over 3,500 undergraduate students and over 1,400 graduate students. We have 170 faculty members and growing. We have 25 research chairs and growing. We are fortunate, and you can see it in the picture, to be home to uh, an expanded and renovated engineering complex, uh, two state-of-the-art innovation hubs, uh, a maker space in Zeta, which is our digital innovation space. And we support over $30 million a year in research funding. Today's topic is something that we are recognized as an international leader in. Um, our energy engineering research uh, is, is among the best and it's matched with what we do in terms of education at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, we are joined here today, uh, one of our speakers is Stephen Bryant, uh, who is our Canada Excellence Research Chairs in New Materials for Unconventional Oil Reservoir in a critical part of bringing the $75 million federal Canadian First Research Excellent Fund to the University of Calgary. We launched our Made in Alberta Energy Engineering Program, which allows students from say to Nate Technical Polytechniques to transfer smoothly into an accredited engineering degree. We also have a minor in energy and environment where we weave together the important topics of energy sustainability and environmental impact. So we can ensure our environmental systems, our energy systems are, are sustainable. We are very much looking towards the future. We are a growing hub in digital futures uh, in respect to energy. We have people like John Chen, who's a, a recognized global leader in virtual reality and data visualization. Roman Shore looks at investigating new technologies to use things like artificial intelligence and automation, machine learning to support uh, drilling, uh, both the operations design and optimization. Um, Throughout the school, I can say that our largest program right now is software engineering, uh, but we also offer a digital minor to students, which allows them to uh, take chemical engineering or petroleum engineering and also gain valuable uh, digital skills, which is so essential in all engineering programs moving forward. Our students are embracing the Calgary culture of innovation. Uh, we are a school that is funded, uh, founded in innovation and entrepreneurship. We do this through things like Launchpad, which we, which we started in partnership with the Hunter Hub for Entrepreneurial Thinking, where it allows students 
to explore their ideas for new ventures. And they get hand-on mentored experiences through this unique program. We have Zeta, which is our digital innovation hub, which includes everything from an IoT lab to a virtual reality lab, as, as well as spaces to do software engineering design. Our maker multiplex is our maker space, which includes, it's a series of eight rooms, which includes everything from your traditional metal and wood shops to music and sound to art rooms to 3D printing. Basically, if you have an idea and you wanna create it, we've got the tools to help students in research do that. This year, we are co-starting the TELUS Innovation Challenge, which will see over $100,000 for students to support innovation ideas, and it'll be taking place February 16th to 19th. And just an example of the time, uh, we ran very successfully uh, engineering design fair and we did it virtually in the spring where we had over 100 students team compete in this industry judged event. And we're looking forward to doing it again this spring. And if you're around, we would love for you to join. So now let me move to introducing our panelists here today. And it's really my honor to start with uh, Dr. Stephen Bryant, who is the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Materials Engineering for Unconventional Oil Reservoir. So certainly can't think of anybody better to be part of the panel today and save all your tough questions for uh, Stephen. He'll be happy to answer them. Uh, next, we are really happy to be joined by John Southwell. Uh, John is an industry research partner of uh, Dr. Bryant. He is the technology director for Nissan Chemical America. Uh, before the event started today, John was sharing that it's a really cold day. He, he is from south of the border. We're really happy that John's here today. Uh, and he said it was minus 10, at which point I commented at minus 10, I'm not always even putting my jacket on when I'm taking our dog out for a walk. So uh, we should hopefully see some different perspectives in the panel as well. And finally, it is my uh, privilege to introduce our third and final panelist, Ali Telmadari. Uh, he is a CERC research associate, and he is also co-founder and CEO of the startup Srin Green Corp. And with that, welcome panelists. And let me start my first question uh, to, to you, Stephen. Um, people won't necessarily know what a CERC program is or a CERC chair. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, uh, what, what is your chair and uh, what have you been doing uh, as part of this chair program? Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Bill. Um, I'll try to keep this concise. Uh, in my opinion, the CERC program, it's a federal program, was a really clever idea to uh, Canadian government came up with, um, I guess, more than a decade ago now. The idea was to bring in international expertise you know, across the country, a variety of disciplines, you know, at the U15 uh, universities to try to help raise the game at already strong institutions. So in the University of Calgary's case, long distinguished record in energy research, it was natural to seek a chair from this program in that area. So um, I was doing well, happy as a clam in my previous uh, academic position, and I uh, got a phone call. Uh, I was not aware of this program, and I said, University of Calgary is interested in talking to you about you know, this potential position. And so I learned an important uh, lesson then, be careful which phone calls you return, because it can change your life. In this case, it was a great, it was a remarkable change for the better. The opportunity here has been tremendous. So we'll get to talk about more of this later. Um, but to get one of these things, what you do is write, what I finally referred to for a long time as the mother of all proposals. And then Bill mentioned the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, which really was the mother of all proposals. Anyway, a big vision with a lot of detail in it as well about how in this case we could use advances in material science that are happening in all different branches of science, all kinds of technologies, none of which have anything in particular to do uh, with oil and gas. So there's all that is going on in one axis. Meanwhile, there's a lot of challenges 
in producing oil and gas with less resource intensity in general, less environmental impact. You know, can we put in less energy? Can we use less sand? Can we use less water? Can we reduce the amount of CO2 involved, et cetera? So that was the mission that we set ourselves. Can we take advanced materials, which haven't been thought of for these other applications, say, ah, we could use that stuff to address this longstanding problem that would then reduce the environmental impact of how we produce oil and gas. That's the nutshell version. That's great, Stephen. I know since you've come to the University of Calgary, you've engaged over a hundred different researchers as part of your activities here. And one of those research you engaged is Ali, who's here as part of our panel today. And I wonder if you and Ali can, can, can talk about how you've taken uh, research that's at the discovery stage and moved it to impact. So from research to commercialization, having an impact in our community. Okay, I'll say just one thing uh, quickly and then turn it over to Ali. Um, one of the great opportunities that came with this chair, a lot of support from the university, uh, a significant amount of money, of course, from the federal government, but it was an opportunity, indeed, I would say a responsibility to do things differently. And what we sort of stumbled into, but it was a, it looks, it looks brilliant in retrospect. We, we rearranged how we did research. We moved into this mode of, let's just bring in some of these interesting materials, some of which I hadn't even heard of before I came up here and just play with them. It looks like playing in the lab. It's, but it's not just playing, it's seeing what their properties are, how they behave with different fluids, always with an eye to Oh, that could be useful for an application that we know of in some sector of oil and gas. Okay, so I called it use inspired science. So some basic discoveries, but if you realize this is a new and different behavior, and you could then say that would be really useful probably for this application, we call that a discovery to impact pipeline. So when we shifted to that mode of research, a number of things came out of this. And one of them is, is, is what Ali is uh, now trying to commercialize. So Ali, I'll turn it over to you to describe more about the particular sure. example of this. Perfect, yeah. So what I would like to say is that to me, or at least the way that I'm looking at the CERC program, uh, uh, the, the focus is to provide the path uh, from creativity to innovation and eventually to entrepreneurship. So. What I mean by that is, you know, th there's a distinction between innovation and, and creativity here. So in innovation, you need to solve the problem or uh, address a challenge, but in creativity, you don't have to do that. You just create, right? Uh, but in order to create an innovative solution, you have to be creative enough. So what I mean by that is, you know, you, you have to be able to think out of the box. You have to be able to explore and fail which is very important. You have to be able to do that. And at CERC, we could afford to be creative enough to come up with lots of innovative solution. And Synergreen, uh, which uh, I'm happy to be CEO of the Synergreen, is, is one example of that. And we had the mindset, uh, support, and infrastructure at CERC program uh, to pursue entrepreneurship as well. And again, I'm just one example of that that could pursue the path from creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And as uh, Dr. Baron mentioned that those creativity in the lab, playing with those materials, see the pr properties of those materials, come up with the new solutions, it's end up with the innovative uh, approach and eventually I'm pursuing the entrepreneurship here. Bill, Steve, it looks like you want to add quick. to that. Ali said something really important here. And sometimes we fail uh, because we'll, of course we do these webinars and we're talking about these great things that, that are successful. That's fine. But what everybody who does innovation knows that some of the, the, the applications we'll talk about today are not things we set out to solve at all. <laughs> we were going one direction and realized it's not working so well for that, but you know what? It could be really useful for this other thing. And so there's a whole nother series we could do on that path. So when we tell the story, we can tell it's a very straight line thing. Here's the papers, here was the discovery. But all those things that didn't work that went along the side, that is really useful exercise. And so having the time uh, and the opportunity to explore those dead ends and having the opportunity to say, that's not gonna work so well, let's go this other way. 
that's been huge. That's been part of what we had the opportunity to do here. So, Stephen, well, I look forward to inviting you to a future panel, and maybe we'll tentatively call it the brilliance of failure, um, like that. because it is such an important part of innovation. John, let's uh, let's hear a little bit from you. We know that engaging industry um, in innovation partnership is is so important. Could you speak a little bit about when's it best um, to first engage with industry and the role that industry plays in in making research impactful uh, in our community? Absolutely. So uh, I think Center Green and, and what Ali and Dr. Brenner are trying to do is a really good example. Um, engaging with industry is important at some point. Uh, you can't do it all yourself. You need partners. You need trusted partners. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, and we've been supporting their research efforts with uh, supplying nanomaterials for quite some time, years and years. I, I got a petroleum engineer from Dr. Bryant's uh, engineering petro petroleum engineering program, and she works for me now. So we, we've been friends for a long time. So where the rubber sort of meets the road and taking innovation and entrepreneurship and making it commercial, making it real, making a business out of it, um, that's a good place to start to engage with an industrial partner. For example, you can have a dream, you can have the chemistry per, uh, prove that it works, but actually turning that into a product that people will sell, that is, uh, that's 90% of the work. And there are regulatory concerns that you have to worry about. There are legal concerns that you have to worry about. There are production concerns. How do you make this stuff? Um, where are you gonna make it? Where does it make sense to make it? Um, what are the volumes that are gonna be required? Who are you gonna sell it to? Who's gonna be interested? Uh, how are we gonna market it? These are all things that have to, that's where the rubber meets the road with an industrial partner. And we're happy to um, be early in with Center Green and support their effort. Dr. Bryant, you look like you want to say something. Sorry. Bill, I'll try not to do this every time, Bill, but John said something that was really important about industry engagement. I will make sure everybody heard that. Nissan Chemical provided us a library of a whole, basically, you know, a sample of almost everything they make, and that's a lot of things, just so we would have commercially available materials to play with in the lab. This is way back at the basic research stage. So they enabled a lot of things. I mean, the discovery that Ali is, is now trying to commercialize, we discovered that using Nissan chemical particles. So that made our research so much easier, right? So, so there was engagement at the very early stage of things because so often people think about, okay, we do this research in the lab and something comes out and then you talk to industry it's possible to have a much more engagement all the way along the process. And that's what I've loved about the example. And so I'm so happy that John could join us on this. You know, so you're hearing you know, both sides of it, early on enabling the research, and now realizing, okay, we could help partner um, to develop this technology using materials that, that they're involved in producing. So I, I love this story of engagement all along the process. Okay. Yeah. Center Green is one good example that's uh, come out of this uh, chair program, but really about this partnership and this approach to innovation and research. Are there some other stories that you can share? Um, you know, I can, um, yeah, there are many stories, uh, not just in oil and gas, but uh, nanomaterials have application in many, many different industries. Our customer base is deep and broad. There are, they're, they're used in catalysts and coatings and all sorts of things. Everybody's glasses, if you have an anti-reflective coating on your glasses, Nissan nanomaterials are right here. They're in, there are 17 different Nissan materials in everybody's iPhone, for example. No one knows they're there, but they're, they're needed. And a lot of it is nanotechnology enabled. And uh, another example would be um, of innovation. People uh, take samples of our nanomaterials, turn them into something that's, that's unexpected. Uh, and unexpected results happen all the time in the laboratory. You're trying for something, Dr. Brown is right, you're trying for something 
you're interested in a, a specific technical vector and then all of a sudden you have a surprising result but it's interesting and possibly useful for example uh, super hydrophobic coatings i had a customer sample materials found something they weren't expecting and and made a nanostructured surface with super hydrophobicity which has many applications you know you could put it on power lines the power lines would never get ice build up on them you could put them on airplane wings stuff like that the the possibilities are really they open up you just sit there and dream about it um, but that came about as a as a surprising result and early industry engagement um, and being intimately involved with your suppliers and your customers. So it's, it's good that I, I'm very happy to know Green and Ali and Steve, um, just so we can and help, help them grow in the right way and help them uh, take advantage of the lessons in industrial chemistry that we've, uh, we've learned and they don't have to go through those learnings. We can just tell them this is a better way to go. This is exciting. Now, the title of our panel today is The Future of Unconventional Oil Reservoirs. So which one of our panelists wants to uh, give their, their first view on what they think the big components of the future will be for unconventional reservoirs? Dr. Bryant, shall we start with you? Happy to, to weigh in. I'll cut me off after a few minutes. I could talk a while on this. The future of unconventional oil reservoirs is pretty similar to the future of conventional oil reservoirs. It's going to be all about carbon, carbon management, producing it in the form of hydrocarbons, dealing with the CO2 that's produced as you produce these hydrocarbons, that's, that's emitted the CO2 that's produced when we then ultimately use those, those hydrocarbons commonly fuels, it's going to be about carbon management. And so there's some interesting ways to combine basically CO2 mitigation with production technologies, some of which uh, well, I, we think a lot of this is on the drawing board, but the, uh, the volumes work out, uh, we think can be integrated with uh, tight gas production, can be uh, uh, helpful in tight oil production, certainly classic enhanced oil recovery. Um, can be um, applied, and Ali can, can talk about that as well. Our definition of unconventional reservoirs has gotten fairly broad. <laughs> so, um, but but even the notion of extending the life of offshore platforms, you know, so the uh, uh, so the Canadian uh, uh, offshore industry, uh, as as is happening in the UK sector of the North Sea, can you convert these into CO2 storage uh, facilities? So. So storing CO2 is going to be a key factor, whether it's coming from blue hydrogen or whether it's coming from uh, steam methane reforming or whether it's coming from uh, uh, burning methane to produce steam. There's all kinds of places where the CO2 management comes in. So this is coming back to what I said earlier. In many of those cases, doing this effectively, if you just do the simplest thing, it's, it's not very efficient. And it's going to be crucial to increase that efficiency. And so that's where material science can help make a difference, enable you to do the whole carbon management piece, both in the efficiency of production and the efficiency of managing CO2 uh, uh, better than we're doing it now. So the general cost to society of continuing to utilize fossil fuels uh, is smaller. Thank you, Ali. It looks like you have something to add there. Yeah, I, I, I just want to uh, continue on that note. Uh, so the, the carbon management in the oil sand or con commercial is, is very crucial uh, at this point. And there are technologies available to mitigate that. But the problem is uh, uh, the industry need to de-risk those technology first. And that's, that's a missing part here, that uh, the, the, these technologies um, uh, need to be de-risked in the industry. So industry can see the benefit and can see the value in both uh, efficient oil production and reducing the GHG emission so they can adopt these kind of technology faster and more efficient. So we can move toward those low carbon 
uh, energy future much, much faster. So there are technology available within the university, within the startups, within the small companies, but there uh, is, is very slow uh, uh, for the companies to adopt those new technologies. And um, uh, that's, that's one of the main challenge uh, uh, for those. But there, I mean, the solution is there, they just need to de-risk it and use it as soon as possible. So John, I'll let you represent all of industry here in, the, in, in this question uh, beyond what you do uh, in, in your day job. Um, what, what, can you speak a little bit more to what Ali was talking about, the, the barriers for companies to adopt new technology um, where, where there does appear to be promise in terms of things like carbon management? Yeah, um, a lot of the barriers we see from an industrial chemistry standpoint are regulatory barriers, uh, legal barriers. So you have to uh, be very careful of um, where you step. Sometimes there's a, a minefield of patents out there and you don't want to infringe anybody's patents. So you have to be very careful. I spent a lot of time working on, we call it freedom to operate. Um, so it's, it's basically patent research. Um, and, and technologically, the barriers are mostly uh, talking customers into adopting new technology. You, you have to show them a very good reason for them to use new, new technology, especially in oil and gas. You know, if someone has an oil well, that's extremely valuable. If you damage that oil well with new chemistry, it, it it's, it means millions and millions of dollars to those people. And sometimes they're, they're small operators. They've only got that one well, or maybe one or two wells, and you've just damaged their livelihood. So you have to be very careful what you put down someone's oil well. Um, in terms of the future of unconventionals, I can give a good example of innovation, uh, frack hit mitigation. And this is something Center Green's interested in. It's something that our customers are already applying nanomaterials for. Uh, frac hits are something that happens when you do hydraulic fracturing. You have uh, a lease on some land and you're hydraulic fracturing the, the hydrocarbon bearing layers on that land. Uh, you, you do one, one frac job and there's initial production of hydrocarbons, but that starts to decline over time as, as high molecular weight junk moves its way towards the well bore. So what people do uh, a lot of times is drill a nearby well and frack again. That that access more access is more of the hydrocarbons on that lease land. But if you frack a well too close to the first well, this is called the parent well. The first one, this is called the child well. Child well. If you frack too close with the child well, then you can impact the production on the parent well. Actually, you can shut it down. When you, when you do this drilling and fracking, um, uh, you can gunk up this parent well even more. So protecting that parent well, uh, that's called a frack hit, by the way. If you frack too close to the parent well, you can have a frack hit has a very damaging effect on the parent well. So to protect that parent well, um, our customers found out that if you pressurize that parent well, make it very high pressure, hydraulic pressure, water, and then frack the child well nearby, there's a net flow from the parent well towards the child well and there won't be damage on this parent well. And our customers find out if you pressurize, if you first put down some nanomaterials, uh, our, our nanomaterial bearing products in the parent well and then frack the child well, actually the, the initial production or the production on both wells goes up dramatically. So that's a great application of both engineering innovation and materials innovation. And uh, we're doing that, Center Green's gonna be doing that with their product and uh, innovation in the technologies, both in, in engineering and materials continue to advance. Every year there are new advancements in, in oil and gas technology. Um, I could say adoption of nanotechnology in oil and gas has been relatively slow compared to other industries. So. For my company, that's a great, and me as a scientist, that's a great thing. We keep seeing places that, uh, in applications in oil and gas, where applications for nanotechnology uh, haven't been adopted yet, and and the the opportunity for for innovation is is 
it, it just abounds in oil and gas. And we, we find new opportunities every week. Uh, my biggest restriction is resources. I need more scientists and I need a bigger laboratory. So that's, that's is, yeah, I could go on about it forever. So I'll, I'll leave it there. So, so let's talk, um, I'm sure many of our attendees um, know nanomaterials, but I'm also sure that there's some that are less familiar with nanomaterials. So John, whether it's the example that you just spoke about where you put the nanomaterials in, um, could the three of you give us the nanomaterials 101 in a couple of minutes here, and then talk about like specifically, like in terms we understand, how are they having these uh, really high impact on some of our processes? Ooh, 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 I'll start. <laughs> you, do you, do you need a chalkboard as well, Stephen, I, to make this? Typically I do, but I'll wave my hands a lot. There's, there's three things that matter here. Uh, nanoparticles are really small. That's why we call them nanoparticles. Um, you know, you take a hundred of them to make up the diameter of one human hair. So, so you can't see them with the naked eye. These are tiny little things. That's important for oil and gas, especially in the subsurface, because then you can, you can imagine, you can actually do, propagate them through reservoirs. The pore space in reservoirs is usually large enough that nanoparticles can go through them. That's one thing. Second thing, it's possible to change the surface chemistry of nanoparticles, and Nissan Chemical does this routinely. You can tune the surface chemistry to be whatever you like, basically. And so that has really interesting effects on how these particles interact with fluids and solids. And in oil and gas, you've got at least two fluids, often three, oil, gas, water. You've got solids called the reservoir itself. And so you can tune how these things interact. Third thing, you can make the particle out of a variety of materials, but some materials are quite interesting. They're magnetic. They respond to electrical fields. They, there's a, they, they luminesce. They do all kinds of interesting things. And sometimes the properties of matter at this nanometer scale are different than they are, you know, just the size of my fist, okay? So they're small enough to be useful in a whole variety of reservoir applications. Uh, we can tune the chemistry to target what kinds of things we want them to do, especially at interfaces. And then thirdly, we can interact with those particles in ways that you can't do with conventional chemicals. So it's really having a new tool in the toolbox to affect what fluids and solids do and how they interact. So there, there's the 101. I'll hand over to <laughs> these applications, guys. Let's go to John, John and then Allie. Yeah, and, and John, when you're answering the question, um, we, we do have uh, some questions uh, from your example that have been posted. So when, when you're answering my question, maybe you could also add uh, a few more details about the uh, nanocoparticles particles um, in your example, both what are they, how are they working, and what happens to them afterwards? Yeah, sure. So um, I can say in general, nanomaterials have been with us the whole time. What's different uh, now is the attention that's been given and the, the research that's been given to nanomaterials in the last 20 or 25 years. It's really come to the forefront of academia and, and industry, uh, but they've been here the whole time. Whenever you, for example, polish your silver, you're making little tiny nanoparticles of, of silver and silver oxide that that go everywhere, that, and that's been happening since people have been using silver. Uh, nanomaterials are in all, all the pigments in all our paints. Um, that's been around for you know a couple hundred years now. Um, anything that you know, any white paint that that's on anybody's wall, that's got nano TiO2 in it, and it's been it's been there the whole time. It's just uh, people's understanding is, has grown in the last couple of decades. Um, so, um, nanomaterials are loosely defined as any, any kind of solid particle that is, uh, one or zero to a hundred nanometers in size. Anything above that is sort of classified as a microparticle. Uh, nanomaterials, um, are various in composition. You can use the whole periodic table to make 
different kinds of nanoparticles. You can make oxides, sulfides. The, the, the palette you can paint from is very, very broad. It, it really covers the whole periodic table. Um, the things that are useful and uh, economic to use, that, that's a, a shorter list. Uh, what we're using mostly in oil and gas is nanoparticles of silicon dioxide. And in layman's terms, that's sand. It's just taking, and you actually make it from sand. Um, one one uh, economic way to make it is you take sand from a reservoir or a mine, you mine sand, you dissolve the sand with chemicals, uh, caustic chemicals that turns the sand into a salt. And then you slowly remove sodium and uh, these little tiny particles, sometimes as, as small as one or two nanometers in size, uh, grow when you start to remove sodium, they grow in the liquid. And you can stop, the, stop it at a certain time to get a certain particle size. You can change it at, uh, during the process to make a different shape. The normal shape is spherical, but you can make different shapes and sizes. You can make anything you want. Uh, and those different shapes and sizes have applications. But uh, for silicon dioxide, you can further take that silicon dioxide nanoparticle and decorate the surface with organic groups. And that has utility when you put uh, just regular uh, nano silica down in oil well, you don't want to do that because there's very salty water down there, very briny water, and that would cause the silica particles to stick together and damage the well. So um, a good advancement has been to learn how to decorate the, the surface of those nanoparticles so that they don't agglomerate in the presence of brine. And that's allowed us to go into the oil and gas market. So there, there are a lot of examples of nanomaterials in industry, but for this, for this specific panel, silicon dioxide is, is the most important one, mostly because it's cheap. It's pretty much the cheapest one out there and you have to take care of, of your customers and, and make it economic for them to do an oil well treatment. Ali, do you have any? Uh, any I would like to build on that. Uh, uh, what I like about the nanomaterial is uh, you're not limited to this uh, simple formulation. So if you want to design a molecule that do uh, uh, some specific application, then uh, you can do that with nano nanomaterial as well with a simple uh, uh, surface modification or simple additive uh, that you can do in, in very large scale with very low cost. And you don't have to stick with one single molecule. And then when, when you're moving to the different application or different objective, you can easily adopt at higher scale and to design that formulation. Uh, and what we are doing at Synergy is very, very similar to that. Uh, we can design that nanoparticle and other molecule that can do different application and can design foam for different application. And uh, I, I can see the chat, Larry mentioned something about the negative uh, impact of uh, nanoparticle to the environment. Uh, uh, so this is another um, uh, feature or properties of the nanoparticle. So you can design the nanoparticle and use the nanoparticle that does not have any negative impact on the environment. In fact, we are working with nanoparticle that is driven from the wood uh, directly. So uh, it's, it's very, uh, uh, the source is pretty clean. And when it go to the environment, uh, uh, it can degrade over time. Uh, so that's, that can, be, so in, the, in, the, in those environments that are sensitive to the type of nanoparticles, you can design that with the, with the uh, nanoparticles that are environmentally friendly and achieve the same performance and you don't need to use a harmful chemical to do that. So let me uh, let me follow up on that one and we've had a few questions that people were asking what happens to them. So uh, John and Stephen maybe you can give your perspectives. Uh, has there been um, e examples or concerns about using nanoparticles in uh, what does the science actually tell us in terms of um, the impact they might have? Like what happens to them after you use them and um, the impact that they may or may not be having? Uh, so one thing, I know John's got to deal with this in the real world. I'll just mention one example of application, which is some of these applications are to improve how fluids move in a reservoir. And the way to, one way to do this is put a fluid in there that essentially stays put. 
So there's a number of applications where the particles will never come out of the reservoir. They will stay down there. As Ali mentioned, they're coated, they're, they're benign. Many of the coatings that are commonly used are things that are literally parts of um, materials that we ingest as humans routinely. Um, so so it's, these things are, it's, it's possible to make them entirely passive. Um, I'll just add one other quick thing. We produce a lot of solids with oil and gas uh, routinely anyway. So uh, of all kinds of sizes, fines, clays, et cetera. Uh, and so dealing with solids production, these things are, are benign and so they can be uh, removed if, if desired uh, or fall out naturally in fluid handling and surface conditions. Yeah, I, it, this question has come up uh, several times from our customers. What's the fate of the nanomaterials? Uh, so if we do an oil well treatment, for example, a simple example, we do a remediation treatment. We pump our, our product. Our product is called NanoActive. Pump NanoActive down a well. Uh, let it sit in the well for as long as the customer will let us leave it there. And then they put the well back on production. And that's basically just to clean up the near well bore region. Um, so what, what's coming out of the well once they put it back in production is uh, sometimes gas. The nanomaterials won't make it into the gas phase. Um, they, they, they don't really have a, a appreciable vapor pressure at all. They're, they're, they're solid particles. They're very, very small, but they're not coming out in the gas. Uh, the other things that come out are produced water and crude oil, basically. And the produced water, the fate of the produced water um, is uh, basically it's, it's very salty water. Many times it has uh, things that you don't want to bring up to the surface. A lot of the times it's just put down a salt water disposal well. And um, in, for example, in the Permian Basin in Texas, there are saltwater disposal wells all over the place. So there are great volumes of produced water, ancient briny water that, that's been down there for millions of years. And it's, you, you gotta deal with it. That's a, the whole huge part of the oil and gas industry is dealing with produced water. So any nanomaterials that are left in the produced water will be pumped back down whole. Um, and if there are nano and nanomaterials left in the crude oil, we've looked for them. We can't really see them. Crude oil is a very messy business, but what happens to the crude oil is that crude oil is shipped to a refinery and it's cracked and it's cracked into different fractions, uh, starting from methane and ethane and butane, um, all the way to liquids, um, like things you have in gasoline, um, all the way down to waxes, paraffins, um, and asphalt, asphaltines. Uh, asphalt is, is made from petroleum that makes roads and driveways and everything. And what's left over after you take, all, take out all of the useful things at the refinery is, it's called coke, refinery coke. And that's actually a fuel that is burned. Um, and um, if the nanomaterials are left over, they're left over in the coke phase and it's just burned. Silicon dioxide doesn't really burn. Um, it might melt, but uh, the slag that's left over after you burn the coke, that's gonna be where the nano, nanomaterials are. But we found that uh, we've looked for the nanoparticles in the produced water, in the, in the crude, and there's not very much coming out. A lot of it is getting left in the hydrocarbon bearing formation. Uh, the, there's rock down there, and there are uh, there are forces of attraction between the nanosilica and the rock. Um, they're they're not strong, but there's a lot of rock down there. It's basically, the nanosilica, the sand, the light, little tiny particles of sand, are sticking to the insides of the of the rock. In, in simple terms. Okay. Now I'm I'm not an expert on nanomaterials, but I know a little bit more. Um, let's go back to some of the applications. Uh, Stephen, you, you talked about, you know, when I, when I asked big picture, what's the future of unconventional reservoirs, you talked about carbon management. What are some of the, uh, or are there uh, applications of nanoparticles um, 
to capture to store uh, CO2? Well, to store or capture CO2, um, there probably are. There may be simpler ways to do that, um, but some of the materials, this is timely because we're just kicking off something. Uh, we'll see what happens. One of, the, one of the interesting challenges is to address carbon, we need to do two major things. We need to avoid emissions, like capturing CO2 as it's uh, from, from fuel being burned. And it's clear now that we will also need to actively pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Legacy emissions from you know, the last 150 years of, of, of uh, economic development. Um, and it's the latter where nanomaterials can become interesting because some of the most exciting ways to do this that involve low energy um, involve a, uh, distributing advanced materials at a scale inside a box, basically that enable you to capture CO2 at low concentrations. So that's that's a, a horizon technology, but I think now with the emphasis on carbon management, it is ripe for innovation. So materials choice in these uh, membranes, basically, that can uh, directly capture CO2 is quite interesting. Industrial scale, uh, you know, natural gas sweetening and so forth, we have ways to do that, that's fine. Just the direct air capture from the atmosphere where there's some big opportunities in nanomaterials. There's one. I could go down the list, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that one. Oh, that's great. What about um, nanomaterials to uh, increase production uh, in, in, in a well? Conventional or unconventional? <laughs> Yeah, I can speak to them. I'll let these guys talk about that. There's it's so good. Yeah, go. go. Ali, do you want to take a crack at it first? Yeah, uh, may, yeah, I I, uh, I can do that. So there there are two ways to use the nanoparticle. Um, one of them is uh, use it directly for oil recovery, so strip the oil from the rock. So I will let John talk about that part. So another way is to design different fluids with the with the with the nanoparticles. Uh, to, to mitigate the issue in the oil recovery, low sweep efficiency. So co conventionally, uh, when, uh, when operator inject water or gas or steam for oil recovery, because of the low viscosity and reservoir heterogeneity, there are channeling, channeling happen between the wells and there are short circuiting between the wells. So this eventually leave lots of oil behind and uh, designing different fluid to improve those sweep efficiency and access more porous space in the reservoir is very important. And we can achieve that with a nanoparticle stabilized fluid. This is one of the, one of the things that we are doing at Synergy, but designing the nanoparticle uh, stabilized foam with CO2 or with steam as a gas phase to mitigate that issue and to have, to, uh, have access to more porous space in the reservoir. So this contribute to the moil ore recovery. And if you are thinking about the CO2 storage, we can access, uh, we can open up more pores for more CO2 storage and maximize the storage capacity as well. Yeah, I can I can speak to it a little bit. That's that's a good summary, Ali. So, at, at increasing production, um, the the way nano nanomaterials are working right now, it's actually a, a very important new piece of business for for my company. Um, so, in, in general terms. What you've got in a hydrocarbon bearing layer is rock and oil and water. The oil is, it's basically, uh, uh, it's various, it depends on where you are, but the composition is just what goes to the refinery. It's, it's the very light ends, which are methane, butane, propane, uh, the liquid ends that are, are various, you know, that make up gasoline, for example. And then there are the very heavy ends that are the waxes and the bitumens that are very uh, prevalent in Alberta and the, the asphaltines. Um, those are all dissolved in the hydrocarbon bearing layer under very high pressure and temperature. And at that pressure and temperature, those very high, high molecular weight things like waxes and bitumens and asphaltines, those are very happily dissolved in the hydrocarbons at that temperature. When you poke a hole down there and start, you know, you start sucking out the the hydrocarbons. 
that that well bore is relatively low temperature and low pressure compared to the rest of the formation. So the oil starts coming out towards the well bore, all those high molecular weight things, those very heavy ends are slow to move in. They reach the, the low temperature and relatively low temperature and pressure at the well bore, and they're not dissolved anymore. They, they, they do what's called precipitation. They precipitate near the well bore and gunk up the rock near the well bore, and they need to get cleaned out. Before nanomaterials, the way to do that was either use uh, pump down gas like CO2 or nitrogen or something that has that, that dissolves those high molecular weight things and you can clean it out. With nanomaterials, you can pump down a nanomaterial fluid and the nanomaterials have uh, the effect of prying those high molecular weight, um, all the gunk, prying it off of the rock surface. We call it the wedge effect. That's, that's a rabbit hole we won't go down. Um, it comes out of some initial research. I, we became aware of it a customer who started buying our nanomaterials for his own formulation for oil and gas fluids. His interest started uh, from some research that was done at the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, basically for, for consumer products like laundry soap and, and cleaning products, where it was noticed the addition of nanomaterials really helped the performance of removing oil from surfaces and, and clothing and fabrics, um, dramatically improved it. Uh, step change in performance. So that was a, uh, our customer applied that to his oil wells, his customer's oil wells, and had fantastic results. So cleaning out the near wellbore region is the main main application that we have right now for, for nanomaterials. But we see lots of opportunities for expanding the application for nanomaterials. Bill, you're no mute. <laughs> uh, it had to happen at some point. So <laughs> why was I on mute? Because one of my kids came in the room asking where the electronic was. So that's why I put <laughs> myself on mute. Um, lots of questions and um, we're getting to them as fast as we can. So maybe a quick answer to this one. There, there's different types of reservoirs and Stephen, this one's directed to you. Um, so are there nanoparticle materials that can, uh, can dramatically materially change recovery for oil and carbonate reservoirs uh, versus um, uh, other types of reservoirs. It comes back to what we talked about earlier. You can tune these things. You can design the surface chemistry of the particle to be appropriate for whatever your application is. And so you know, the different mineralogy, you know, it's calcium carbonate, uh, uh, and uh, dolomite and a carbonate reservoir, it's silica and a sandstone, uh, to the extent that that changes the way the surface of that reservoir interacts with the fluids, you can tailor your particles, or these days you can choose one off the shelf. This was out of these point, it's already made, which has the properties that work for that reservoir. So that was a long way of saying yes. Uh, you can do this. Uh, it's, it's, it's not And if they're really the keen, they should give you a call, Stephen? Mm -hmm. there, yeah, absolutely. Anybody would be happy. But the key point is, we're not agnostic to the reservoir type. We can tailor to the reservoir type and the fluid type. That's the advantage of this class of material. What about using nanoparticles particles to slow down corrosive processes in oil field materials? John, okay. you're nodding. I'll give it to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, corrosion is a huge problem. Uh, many megatons of chemicals, traditional chemicals, are sold um, for corrosion prevention um, already. And um, we're just starting to apply nanomaterials to cor corrosion prevention. Uh, there are other applications, for example, um, scale um, happens. It, you know, it salts fall out of water and gunk up the equipment, paraffin is a huge problem in oil production. Paraffin um, falls out of solution and gunks up the process. It's not just downhaul, but the surface equipment and pipelines. Paraffin's a giant problem. Um, iron control. There's a lot of iron dissolved in the water. 
and um, it, 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 it creates a sludge with, with uh, crude oil uh, that is really difficult. It gunks up wells and it gunks up equipment. So iron control is a huge problem. These are all new applications for nanomaterials. Like, like we said, new opportunities keep popping up every week. Can you use nanotechnology for, for corrosion prevention? Absolutely. It's already been done, being done by us in Japan for, it's called the electrical steel industry. And you can apply nanomaterials to, to metal surfaces that protect them very effectively, not forever, but very effectively. And it, essentially you're putting little tiny particles of sand on the surface. They act like uh, little ball bearings. It's, an, a, it's a, a barrier to the corrosive chemistry. Um, and um, like Dr. Bryant and Ali were saying, uh, you can tailor the chemistry of the silica to do just about anything you want. Uh, so interact with those corrosive species before they get to the metal. Absolutely. It's already being done in other industries. Applying that to oil and gas will take a little bit of tweaking, but absolutely. And the only, the only real barrier to making that happen is, for my company is resources. That's why it's really a pleasure for me to work with people like Center Green because they, they can attack problems that I don't have the resources to get at. And they're actually doing that right now. And we're very interested in what they're doing and we wanna bring it to the United States. We wanna take their products and apply them for our customers. So, um, you know, it's basically, I, you know, it's a slow, slow, slow project to build a bigger lab and get more chemists. It's faster if I can interact with innovative new companies, startups like Synergreen, that, that speeds up innovation for everybody. Oh, this, this has been great. And I know we're running out of time. So let me quickly give each of you 30 seconds in terms of the future of unconventional oil reservoirs. What do you think the, uh, in the next three to five years, what's gonna be the big technological change uh, that you're most excited about? Why don't we start with Ali this time and then maybe uh, John, then Stephen. Yeah, sure. Um... I will, I will do it in 20 seconds. So I don't think there is a technology uh, and we have to use uh, uh, whatever technology that we have right now on the table and all the innovation that has been done and is being doing in the university, in the, in the research centers, uh, we have to be able to provide that barrier to de-risk those technology so industry can adopt and use it as soon as possible. So we can move on with the current technology, improve the efficiency, reduce the GHG emission and provide the, uh, a platform for transition toward the low carbon energy future as soon as possible. So that's that's the main thing uh, to me, um, not air technology. Thank, thank you, Ali. Over to you, John. So the most exciting opportunity, um, there, there are many, but if I had to pick one, CO2 capture is, I mean, that's, that's on everybody's mind right now. And nanomaterials have some distinct advantages over traditional materials technology that can really uh, be a game changer. And just about everywhere we've applied nanotechnology to where it wasn't there before, it's there has been a step change in performance. So CO2 capture, I don't know how to do it yet. I don't, I don't have a silver bullet, but I would be surprised if nanotechnology is not involved. Stephen? Biggest influence, Bill, is not gonna be innovations which is what we typically think about and have most of the time out here, but innovators. What we've been able to do and are increasingly doing at the University of Calgary is train students, not just for the way the industry always has been, but to approach things from an innovation and entrepreneurial thinking standpoint. Ali is an example. Uh, instead of going straight into a nice academic job, he's out trying to commercialize something. That's what I think we can have the most impact is, and we're working on this now, we've had a lot of students come through our lab who have caught the bug of innovation uh, and approaching out of the box thinking and so forth. So it's getting these solutions implemented. It's increasing the number of people thinking about the problems and challenges differently, as John alluded to. That's how I think we're gonna have the most impact. 
innovation has gotten the industry to where it is step after step after step is mostly about how to access resources. Now the innovation continues to be that and carbon management. So it's ripe for continued innovation to maintain this uh, profile that we've been on. Some very wise words to uh, wrap up our session here today. Um, I want to thank our three panelists for, uh, for your participation. I want to thank everybody, uh, our attendees, for joining and for sending in questions. Really did enjoy our, our discussion here today. We talked a lot about nanoparticles, and clearly we got to talk more about nanotechnologies. And so I'm really happy to let everybody know that on our next Schulich Connects, we're going to talk about not just nano. Uh, particles, but nanotechnology. Um, and we hope to uh, see everybody there. And thank you all so much for joining us here today.